Heavenly Father, we commit this session to you. We, Lord, we know that you are present here with us. And we want to hear from you, Lord, Holy Spirit. Come and teach us, O oh Lord. Show us, Lord, what it means to live a life that is pleasing to you and that would glorify you also. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This session is entitled The Gold Standard. And if you're familiar with this one term, the gold standard actually is a monetary standard. And from the business dictionary, I got this definition. It is a system of backing a country's currency with its gold reserves. And such currencies are freely convertible into gold at a fixed price, and the country settles all its international trade transactions in gold. Now, if you understand and you come from the financial um, sector, this would mean something to you. That in times past, this is the standard. If you're talking about how much things are worth, they will measure it according to the value in gold. And that's why gold became, or gold was made as a standard, and we get this one term called the gold standard. Along the way, the gold standard came to mean also benchmark or a point of reference. You can see it as a yardstick to say this is the standard. This is that gold standard we're aiming for. And as you look at this picture, I've chosen one that is a plumb line that you will take reference from this one standard. As I'm sharing this with you, you must be wondering how it ties in with the verse that we are reading. This evening, we're going to talk about one verse only. One verse, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. If you look at your commentaries, you can Google this. Automatically, you will find that this verse is referred to as the golden rule. The golden rule. And this is the standard which kingdom people must live by or to. This is that standard. And that's why I've used it creatively from the golden rule to call it as the gold standard. If you ask yourself, what standard should I live up to? It's the gold standard. Everything else falls flat. This is the gold standard. Oh, but how about him? How about her? Never mind. Gold standard. How about that church? Never mind. Gold standard. This is the golden rule. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. And we'll spend the rest of this time just unpacking this one verse and to see how it relates to us and how we are to apply it. As you know, context is always important for us when we study the Bible. So if you look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12, you will see that it comes at a certain place that can give you both an immediate context as well as a broad context. There are two contexts that we can consider, and both are correct and both are equally important. Let's look at the immediate context first. Obviously, it comes after Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 11. That was what we looked at last week. And you would already know it is about asking, seeking, and about knocking. And it ends in verse 11 about how good our Heavenly Father is, how much more He knows to give us the right thing as well as the right gift for us. And He's already given us the best gifts if we don't look at all those material things that distract us. He has given us Jesus, right? The in, oh, praise be to God for the indescribable gift. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. In context, we also understand that He gives us the Holy Spirit. And we keep asking and seeking and knocking to keep receiving the things of the kingdom. With this one word, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. That therefore can be linked to the example of a heavenly father. Now, if he knows how to be so good, now therefore, you be so good also. If he knows what works best for you and for everyone else, then you also, therefore, this is the way that you should also live. Therefore, we are to be like him. 
So this immediate context links this one verse as a sort of a summary or as an example of how good our Heavenly Father is and in the same way we are to be like Him. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, there's one line in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. In Luke chapter 6, verse 36, be merciful as your Heavenly Father is merciful. And so Jesus might just be saying here, He's such a good Father. He knows so well. Therefore, be like Him. And this is how you apply that. But if we look at the broad context, then really Matthew chapter 7, verse 12 is a summary of all that Jesus had been teaching all the way back. From Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Now, some of us might be scratching our head because that was quite a while back when we looked at Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. But chapter 7, verse 12, this one verse, closes off this entire section. Why? Because of the law and the prophets. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. He's saying, if you want to look at the law and prophet, this is what this one verse is saying. This is how you interpret the law. But you back up to chapter 5, verse 17, he begins by saying, Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So these two verses becomes like the, the book ends. He introduces the law and the prophets. He goes on to explain it and he teaches and he teaches and he teaches and right at the end he concludes and he bookends it and he frames it and he concludes that and he says, now this is what the law and the prophets would be all about. In a contemporary setting, you know, preachers like to do this now. If you forget everything, then I just want you to remember this one big idea. A preacher will come up with a nice statement that rhymes or sounds very simple, very catchy. Right? And then you will take it down and then you will post it on Facebook or Instagram. If there's one thing that you should remember after all these weeks, after all this time, is this one big idea, one line only. Memorize this. Post this really on Facebook. Instagram it. Burn it deep in the hard drive of your, of your heart. Get it into the software even. One line, this is the big idea because you can apply this teaching in any situation. This is the big idea. One verse he concludes with. But is this teaching revelational? I'll tell you how revelational it is because you know the kingdom. It is upside down. Anything upside down would definitely get our attention. But let's look at some teachings that may sound familiar to what Jesus is really saying. Let me give you an example. In Judaism, Rabbi Hillel, now he, this is the rabbi that was very famous in a time around where Jesus lived. A pagan came to Rabbi Hillel saying that he would convert to Judaism if Hillel could teach him the whole of the Torah in the time he could stand on one foot. Now how long can you stand on one foot? Not very long, huh? And so, meaning to say, summarize everything. Just tell me what the essence is. So Rabbi Hillel replied and said this, What is hateful to yourself, do not do to your fellow men. That is the whole Torah. The rest is just commentary. Just go and study it. Sounds similar, right? Yeah, it sounds about the same. Confucius. This is BC, right? Confucius, do not do to others what you do not want them to do to you. Another wise saying from another wise man. In the Hindu religion, this is the sum of duty. Do not do to others that will cause pain if done to you. In the Buddhist text, hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. And so at a glance, when you listen to it first time, just in passing, you might say, nothing new, what's so revelational? But I told you the kingdom is upside down, right? If you look at these sayings, it sounds the same, but you notice it is, they are all worded negatively. And to apply this rule, all you have to do is nothing. Don't do anything, 
I mean, if I'm scared to hurt you, uh, because I don't want to hurt you because it will hurt me, right? Then I don't do it. Uh, right? So I just withdraw. I just avoid. Uh, I just be a hermit and go to a mountaintop and silent retreat for the rest of my life. Is that the best way to apply it? Definitely what? Because it says there, don't do to others. And so to be safe, to apply this and to keep this perfectly, let's be a recluse. Let's avoid people and there will be no problems. I've always said this to Christians. Do you know that by yourself, if you live alone, you'll be the perfect Christian? But it's when you get into relationships with others, that's where it shows up all the problems and all the weaknesses. And if you can do this well and just don't do anything, and if you can do it really well, that's not too bad. Lah. But here comes the joke and the funny thing. We can't even do nothing correctly. <laughs> just think about this. We try not to hurt people, and yet we still hurt people. Quite hopeless, right? Quite desperate lah, if you think about this. And yet even if you keep this perfectly, it is really not enough. Because this is only one side of what life is. You know you cannot ever be always alone. And that's why people call this the silver rule. Not quite there. Good advice, but not quite there. Compared to the golden rule, this is only the silver rule. And for us, this standard, already difficult to live to, but if you, even if you do that, you have only reached a silver standard. The gold standard is radical. Jesus was radical in the way he interpreted the law and the way he presented the law. All the other wise people worded it negatively. He turns it the other way around and it says, do this. What you want people to do to you, you do to them. Jesus didn't say avoid. He didn't ask you to, to run away and lock yourself in a room. He says, no, 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 no. I'm turning it upside down because the kingdom is such. He's not just trying to hold back. Even the, the Ten Commandments, most of them you read is do not murder, right? And so to the Jews, you will look at it and say, oh, I didn't kill anyone, so I'm quite good. Jesus is really saying here, don't just not do something bad, do something that is good. And that's radical if you stop to think about it. And I give you three things that I think would help us to understand, maybe break down this one whole statement for us. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. What our Lord is saying is this. Firstly, Take the initiative. What do you want someone to do to you? What do you want others to do to you? You don't wait for that first. You do it first. Take that initiative, number one. And as you do that, what you're really doing is demonstrate the kingdom. Whatever is good for that person's well-being, because you desire for that to be done to you, obviously cannot be bad, man. It must be something that is good. As you do this in the context of what the kingdom of God is all about, you are demonstrating a kingdom. Live this out. As our Heavenly Father is good, how much more that He knows how to give us good things. In the same way, therefore now, live out the kingdom. So number one, take the initiative. Number two, demonstrate the kingdom. And he says, whatever you want others to do to you, in the whatever, you also do the whatever to them. Make use of every opportunity. And I tell you, swell, plenty of opportunity. Huh? There's no way any one of us can say, don't have what? Because you are taking the initiative. If you would obey this command by the Lord, if you would be led by the Holy Spirit, you will know how to take the initiative. You know how to demonstrate the kingdom. You know how to make use of every opportunity. This is the big idea. Now how did Jesus sort of turn things upside down and so on? Was there and is there a scriptural basis? Now quite obviously because He's the king that gave the law. He must have known the law and He knows how best to interpret it. One Old Testament text that is popular and familiar would be in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. And it reads, You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. Do you recognize the next part? But you shall love your neighbor 
as yourself. That's that one phrase. And I believe Jesus was inspired by that and motivated by, moved by that. In the same way you want to love yourself, now you have to love your neighbor. So whatever you want people to do to you, all the good stuff that you want, all the good words you want to hear, all the good things that you want to receive, now do that same thing to someone. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's what it is. Now in Matthew chapter 22, verse 39, Jesus quotes this one verse again. But it is combined with another one. Remember, there was this guy who came up to Jesus and asked him a question and was testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Which one is the most important commandment? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Then he didn't stop there. He went on. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, he didn't say that this is the first and that is the second because he says it is like it. He's saying that the first and the second on par, same. It's the same. And it always starts with God, loving God. And if you say you love God, you cannot hold back in loving your neighbor. Then he concludes and he gives a different type of a summary here. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. Exactly the same thing. Jesus was being very, very consistent. It's about loving God. But if you say you love God, you have to love your brother or your neighbor. We see the apostles pick up this understanding in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 13, verses 8 to 10, Paul says this, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying. Namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. See, the Apostle Paul expands on this teaching but stays consistent with Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. In verse 3, he says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. Whatever you want men to do to you, whatever your interest might be, will you look out for others in that same way? 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 to 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. You know, I confess, huh? I don't like to read 1 John. It's very hard to stomach a lot of what he says, you know. Huh? If you born again, you don't love, huh? you're actually not born again. Huh? How many people in the church are not born again? We really struggle with a lot of his sayings. Anyway, he says, he goes on. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. The first and the second commandments are the same. James chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. This is one of those verses you read, read and you're like, oh, jalad, ouch. Very painful, right? If, if, if you know what you want and yet you don't do it for someone else and that's good, the good that you know and you don't do it, that's sin. It's heavy, it's heavy going. But you can see the scriptural basis that is there. Love sums up the entire law. If we say we love God, I love you, I love you, I love you, and we do not love each other, and we do not act it out, demonstrate the kingdom, make use of every opportunity to show that up, then we are liars. We are, we are, playing, we are playing the fool. We are playing church. We are hypocrites. 
one verse. It is the upside down kingdom, is it not? Jesus takes things and he just turns it on its head. And now that we've got the context and we understand a little bit of what this one verse is, for the rest of this time, I want to see how we can apply this. And when I looked at this one line called the upside down kingdom, I see the context of Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. This was the picture that came to my head. Now, some of you have never seen this piece of machinery before. Let me describe it for the sake of our SoundCloud hearers. This is an open reel player. Okay, and there's tape in the open reel. And last time, when policemen used to wear shorts, Okay, not so far ago. Huh? Yeah. This is how we listen to music. It's a magnetic tape. You record things on it and you play. The tape goes through a tape head. It reads the material that is there and it is translated into sound. Have you heard of this thing called playing the tape backwards? And it's called backmasking, right? And sometimes the uh, Christians who have also realized that in satanic circles, they have tried to encode certain things. If you play the tape backwards, it, it, it's not the song that you know. It, it, it is a different message that comes out. And there's a subliminal effect when you're playing it forward. You don't realize that what that message is, it can get into your subconscious. Still debated all over. But I thought, since it's an upside down kingdom and Jesus has been taking things and turning things on its head, why don't I play the tape backwards? And let's start with Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, and let's not rewind, but play it backwards all the way to Matthew chapter 5, right in the beginning. How would it look if Jesus preached the sermon backwards? How would it be if he started with Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, and began there and worked his way back or forwards? And so I'm going to try that. Can I have some creative license with you? And we know it's not satanic because we have the Holy Spirit with us. And who knows that in your subconscious, when I'm doing this, playing the tape backwards as it were, in the subconscious, the the Holy Spirit might be just putting something inside there for you. No effort for you. You just listen. Okay? So Jesus wouldn't start with the word therefore. He would have declared, now this is the law and the prophets. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. And immediately as he says that, I can imagine the whole congregation is going like, whoa, very difficult there. How to make it? Jesus then continues and he says, you can't do this on your own. And that's why you need the Holy Spirit. Ask for the Holy Spirit. Seek to be able to live like that. Knock for the opportunity so that you can be a blessing to the people all around you. Because this is what it is. This is the law and this is the prophets. How badly do you want to be able to be a kingdom blessing? I assure you, we will need the Holy Spirit to live out the gold standard. He continues and he comes to this point about judging rightly yourself as well as others. And this is his point. I want you to be gracious and I want you to be merciful. How do I apply this one line, this big idea? Would you like others to criticize and to condemn you? Obviously not. Then stop it. Don't do that to other people. Instead, what would you like? Oh, I want people to affirm me. I want people to encourage me. Then do that. Get out there and affirm someone rather than when you first see that person, you you, you beat this guy over his head and you begin to condemn and you write this person off. But at the same time, because it is about judging, Would you like others to give you an accurate assessment in a loving and a gracious way? Of course. We're all happy with some constructive feedback, right? So why don't you do that? Why don't you take the initiative, right? Why don't you demonstrate the kingdom of grace and of mercy and make use of that opportunity to give feedback in a very gracious way? And use wisdom. Choose the right words. Be tactful. Be self-controlled. Do these things. But what if you see something that's really not right? Okay, people might have noticed that in you also. So would you like others to be merciful when pointing out your mistakes and faults, forgiving you and accepting you where you are in your spiritual walk towards maturity? Yeah, 
Of course I want. Then do the same. Then be merciful. Forgive others. Let it go. Right? Even as you spot certain things that are not correct, forgive them. Give them space to grow because that's a kingdom attitude. Would you like others to be bold and courageous to stand for righteousness, right? And we, we just prayed about this just now. We need people to stand strong. Then why don't you go and do the same? Then you be strong also and you be courageous and to speak up when it is time to speak up. See, these are all kingdom things. But we don't realize that there are opportunities all over the place. Now, I haven't forgotten about the dogs and the pigs. Would you like others to receive feedback well and be open to correction? <coughs> Definitely, right? I mean, you try your best to be such a nice person and you talk to them and then they want to claw your eyes out. If you desire that of others, then you also do the same thing. Receive feedback well. Don't be prideful. Don't be a dog or a pig. Jesus would go on and talk about finances, about wealth about focusing on the right things. So Matthew chapter 6, 19 to 34, be generous. The opposite of not laying up is to give away. So be generous. Would you like others to be generous with you, to share what they have with you? If you say yes, then learn how to be a good steward. Learn how to share things with others and learn also how to give. There are so many people who need things. Would you like others who have the means to help you out when you don't have the means or you're struggling to make ends meet. If that's your desire, then you learn how to help others who may be worse off than you are. Don't be selfish to only think of yourself, your needs and your wants. Would you like other churches or ministries to help your church or your ministry? If that's your desire, then help other churches and help other ministries. And as a ministry... Collaborate with others because in time, you will also desire for other ministries to collaborate with you. And I believe we need to learn that. Because if it's my church versus your church and my ministry versus your ministry, then we are just standing apart from one another. We are not applying this gold standard. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 18. This talks about hiddenness in your prayer, in your giving, in your fasting and so on. Then Jesus would say, this is how you apply this in the, into this situation. Be real and be authentic versus spiritual showmanship and hypocrisy. Would you like others to be honest with you? If you say yes, then do it to others. Be honest, be real, be authentic. Now be the real deal. Would you like Christians to stop being hypocrites? Then we must stop being hypocrites. Begin to walk the talk. Whatever the Lord is saying, you do your best to, to live this out, asking the Holy Spirit to help you. Would you like others to be humble instead of prideful and showy? Then we be humble. Be content with being hidden, known only to God. See, Jesus states this one principle, whatever you want men to do to you, then do also to them. Now he begins to get a little bit more radical now. He says, now, I want you to be radical to love your enemies. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. Now this gets really tough, right? Already those that we like and don't mind, eh? it's already difficult for us to do the things that would be needful for them. Talk about loving and blessing your enemies. Would you like others to love and bless you? Definitely, yes. Would you like your enemies to love and bless you? Oh, definitely, yes. And so you must start loving and blessing them first. You want an opportunity? i give you a few examples. Is there someone you cannot tahan? Is there someone you cannot stand? Some of you are now thinking about your boss. It may be a colleague. Maybe it's a church member. Perhaps it's a cell leader. <laughs> How about a pastor? What can you do? I don't know. These are just examples. You can think about it. 
the Holy Spirit can give you a prompter or something. Maybe you want to send him or her a text just to say, Hi, how are you? Ask the Lord to anoint your fingers to be able to type that. And after type it, to be able to say, Yes, Amen, send. And then cannot retrieve. How about offering to pray for him or for her? Maybe they want to be easy, huh? don't want to see the face, don't have to do anything. But even the thought of just to pray and, and to bless this person, we struggle with it, don't we? We'll fight against it. Say, so why? They did bad things to me and so on. But the Lord is saying, whatever you want people to do to you, if, if, if you want someone to love you and to bless you, then you do the same to them, whether you but this person you like or whether this person is an enemy. How about inviting this person one day for coffee? Okay, I'm really pushing it, right? <laughs> Be radical. It will really surprise this person. I'm not saying the person might accept. I'm not saying the person will love you suddenly. Jesus didn't say all those things. He just said, whatever you want men to do to you, you do to them first. That's the law and the prophets. That's what it is. Be easy going. Matthew chapter 38, verse 42, where the title really is, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And so you punch me, I'll punch you. You spit at me, I'll spit at you. That's how we tend to think. But do you like people who keep retaliating and arguing and fighting with you? I don't like that. Do you like it? Nobody likes it. Do you like people who think they must always be right and must always have the last say? I know you don't like, I also don't like. So the point is, don't be one. That you've got to stop doing things like that yourself. Don't be calculative. Don't be calculated. Don't nitpick. We are very good at that. If you need to nitpick, nitpick hermeneutically and study your Bible. But it's not just a don't that you bite your tongue and then you don't do anything. Instead, be willing to give up your rights. Let them have their way. Even if it means being inconvenienced by that act of love. Jesus goes on in the teaching to say, if anyone wants to sue you, let him have your coat. If anyone wants to ask you for things, just give it to him, let him borrow. So let's ask the question, if you needed something and you approach someone, would you like this person to lend it to you without asking 1,000 questions? It's very hard huh, to sum up. Huh? I mean, we're being wise, what? must discern. What? <laughs> then could we be that person to give without having to know anything? Can we be helpful? Can we be generous? Can we be, be gracious? I'm sure I'll ask a few things just to understand the context and if it satis- even if it doesn't satisfy you, would you just say, okay, never mind, Let- let's just go for it. At this juncture, I must say, these are the words of Jesus, not mine. <laughs> because I know you're listening to this and you're like, are you real or not, Hanson? I mean, come on, man. It's the gold standard. Remember? And then in Matthew chapter 5, 33 to 37, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. So the Lord says to us, be trustworthy. Be dependable, be a person of integrity. Let me think about it. Do you like people who say one thing but mean another thing? Oh, you're very irritating, right? <laughs> those who give excuse after excuse after excuse, no matter what, will find a reason. Why not. The yes is like, don't know what. The no is like, don't know what. Then don't be like them. Instead, let your yes, really, if you say it, then, then mean it. You're responsible. You're dependable. This is going to hit, uh, this is a sore point. It's a raw nerve, but I'm going to say it. Be punctual. <laughs> be punctual, right? I mean, that's what it is. Your, your word is your word. I mean, we were starting this time. Let's come. Let's go for it. I mean, I struggle with it, and I know you struggle with it too. Do you like people who are always late? If it's your wedding and then you're waiting. <laughs> but when it comes to other people's wedding, you say, never mind, I'll show later on. <laughs> Whatever you want men to do to you, you do to them. 
Can we be a kingdom ambassador that represents the king well? Because our king's word will never fail. What he says, it will be done. Are our words good, you see? Matthew chapter 5 and then verse 27 to 32. And this is a section where Jesus taught about you shall not commit adultery. Then he talks about divorce. And so here he's saying, be pure and be faithful. Be diligent in your marital relationship. If we just look at do not commit adultery, then we just avoid adultery, we just avoid divorce. That's only half. Remember that's worded negatively? So as long as you're not adulterous, you're not divorcing your wife or your husband, then you're okay. No, Jesus says, that's a good start. But I want you to work at your marriage. Whatever you want your spouse to do to you or say to you, you start by doing for your spouse or to your spouse and saying it to them. So husband, love your wives because you want your wife to love you. Wife, you want your husband to love you? Then love him first. Work on your marriage. Sometimes we hear a lot of ladies, I will submit if you love. Then a man say, I will love if you submit. Then each one waiting for another one, then wait until when? And that's why marriages fail. But if we apply the gold standard, if your marriage is a gold standard, then what you desire for your spouse to do to you and for you, you already know what you should be doing to her or him or for her or him. Paul actually wrote this in Ephesians 5.29, talking to the husband. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. In other words, Paul was saying to the husband, to the man, you know how to look after your own body, right? Now your wife is an extension of who you are. As you love yourself, love your wife. Don't wait for your spouse to make the first move. Remember, you take the initiative. You demonstrate the kingdom in the marriage. How awesome is that? And you make use of every opportunity. So to apply this one rule, you address and you also work on issues that threaten and weaken your marriage. For example, don't avoid for fear of confrontation. Men are very good at that. Somehow, outside, very bold and very courageous. But when it comes to a relationship, uh, very fearful. Because the moment open mouth only, uh, confront, fight. And so I don't want to fight. I retreat and I avoid. Jesus is saying, don't do that. Instead, initiate the talk. Start that discussion. If you have to fight, then fight like that. Fight to be the first to say, I love you. Fight to be the first to say, I appreciate you. Fight to be the first one that would own up and say, I'm sorry. Fight to be that first one to carry out acts of love and of kindness to affirm one another. Don't give the call or the silent treatment. This one is to the ladies. The guys would avoid because of confrontation, for fear of confrontation. The ladies, they don't avoid. They just go cold. They just go quiet. And somehow the man is supposed to know something is wrong. <laughs> so ladies, don't just drop hints all over the place where usually the guy never notices in the first place. And then that makes you even more upset. Don't ask me how come I know so much. Huh? <laughs> Make the first move. Whether the man or the woman, don't rationalize or justify addictions. And we're talking about dealing with lust down here. And today, it affects both the men as well as the woman. So don't just try to hide it and not say anything about it and think everything is okay, I'm sweep it under the carpet. Do something. Seek counsel. Stay in accountability. If, if your partner or if your spouse is caught in something like that, you would, want, you would desire for him or her to seek help, wouldn't you? So if it happens to you, 
then you too must seek help and counsel. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 26. And this is the teaching about you shall not murder. And Jesus then said, oh, if you're only, even if you're angry, already that's a big problem. He, he nips it at the bud. And does it mean just don't be angry? No, it's not just about anger management. It's not about going to book a slot in the, now got anger room, right? Or rage room. <laughs> oh, where you cannot throw things at home. So you go to another place to throw things. It's not about that. It's not even just about controlling your, your, your temper. You've got to work things out. It's not about sweeping things under the carpet, ignoring the issue, and refusing to acknowledge the elephant in the, in the room. You've got to deal with these things. Do something about it. And if you have someone who is like that, unfortunately, then Jesus is then saying, also, be willing to reconcile. Always be eager to restore. Be willing to forgive. Be willing to overlook. And most of the time, our anger, if it's not curbed at that point, it escalates. And that's why it leads to murder. It leads to a killing of a relationship. So our Lord is really giving good, great advice down here. Apply the golden rule. Oh, I'm upset with you. Release it. Because if someone was upset with yourself, would you want this person to say, I'm upset, but let, let's let it go. Let's talk about this. Let's, let's restore. Let's reconcile. Would you like that person to do it? Then you do it to someone else. Initiate the process. And many of the other examples you can also apply for this teaching. And finally, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, he then says, I didn't come to destroy the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill it. This is how you fulfill it. This is the gold standard. And if you live this gold standard, whatever you want someone to do to you, you begin by doing this to them. This will fulfill the law. It will fulfill it. I've given you all the examples. I've preached from the beginning all the way right to the end now. And I conclude by telling you, this is the righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees and of the scribes. And you know it cannot be done without the help of the Holy Spirit. See, the Pharisees set up an elaborate system how they can safeguard themselves from breaking the law. Oh, if it's like this, if it's like that, no, we better not touch it, we better move far away from it. It's always an avoidance kind of a thing. But Jesus turns it upside down and says, don't, don't, that's, that's nice, that's good, okay? But it's going to kill you. But with the Holy Spirit, you will learn to love as the King loves and understands the law. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. And he goes on. If you lift the gold standard, you will... You, Naturally, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. If you live like that, you will stick out. You will be an influence, a positive influence. You will be a kingdom influence. Can you imagine if everyone in this world lived the gold standard? Oh, what a beautiful world it would be. Right? The world would be such a much, much better place. Okay, don't talk about the world because they don't understand this law. They don't understand this kingdom. What if all Christians lived in this way? Do you think things will change? Do you think we will make an impact? Do you think we will be loved by more people and accepted by a lot more? Well, that's what we hope. Huh? We hope that as we do good, we will be accepted. But let me warn you, the tape has not been played to the end yet. The tape continues to roll. Because in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 to 12, Jesus talks about, blessed are those who are persecuted. So we may want to be salt. We may want to be like, we will live the gold standard. We think, man, if we are like that, everyone's going to love us. Well, you see, the good news of the kingdom is not just being nice people who live harmoniously with other people, tolerating one another for the sake of world peace and unity. The good news of the kingdom is also about the righteousness of the kingdom. And in the world we live in today, everybody loves rights, but no one likes righteousness. 
And if you want to live the law and the prophets and the way of the king, you must stand for righteousness. And if you desire that someone would share with you what righteousness is, then that's for, his, for my good, then for your good, I will share what righteousness is to you also. But I must challenge you and remind you, try standing up for righteousness and see where that gets you. And that's why Jesus says, you be careful. You be careful of these people who do not like righteousness. You be careful of those who have a religious spirit. I tell you the craziest things. If, if you and I would live even close to this gold standard, the religious people actually don't like it because they like the laws, they like the rules, they like the do this and the don't do that. Jesus and His disciples were persecuted by actually the religious and the political institutions. And this is what we must remember. Self-righteousness will always oppose kingdom righteousness. Self-righteousness will always oppose kingdom righteousness. When Christians act in love without retaliation, there's every possibility that we may be taken advantage of. And often for no rhyme or reason. Just ask Jesus. Okay, closer to home. Ask Ahok. Right? He's a good governor. Everybody says he's a good governor. Change have been positive. He's doing good things. But you see, the religious spirit will not stand for it. And ultimately, let's remember this. It is a spiritual battle between one kingdom and another. It's not about being nice people and living together in peace. That's not it. It's about a spiritual battle. But I'm thankful that the promise is there for us that when the light shines, the darkness cannot overcome it. And as we pray just now, the greater the darkness, the brighter the light. And now Jesus ends with an awesome, awesome, awesome promise. He says, you live this rule. You fulfill the law with love. Whatever you want men to do to you, you do to them. You be that salt. You be that light, even if it costs you something. Because I declare, you are blessed. You are blessed. This is the promise. Makarios, you are people who are blessed of the kingdom. We are playing the tape backwards, right? Verse 9, all the way back to verse 3. Blessed are the peacemakers. Why? Because as you do this, you truly are the sons of God. Blessed are the pure in heart. As you are faithful, as you are living with integrity, and you are you're saying as things as you mean it, you will get to see God. Blessed are the merciful, because as you are gracious, as you are merciful, our Heavenly Father will give you mercy, and He will lavish mercy upon you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. As you stand and you fight for righteousness, you will be filled. Blessed are the meek. People push you around, but it's not that you are weak. You are strong. You understand what it is. But you're self-controlled. This is the promise for you. You will inherit the earth. Blessed are those of you who all mourn. They say bad things to you. They wake you. They take advantage of you. But there will come that time where you shall be comforted. Blessed are the poor in spirit if you are broken for the things of the kingdom. And he ends with this beautiful, beautiful one line of this entire sermon. For yours will be the kingdom of heaven. That's your promise. Very different when I looked at the sermon upside down. Many times when we preach and we start something, by the time we come to the end, I mean, we have lost half the congregation sometimes. They're thinking of lunch, they're thinking of dinner. Maybe some of the people on the, on the mountain were like that. Leh. But now I started the other way around, so you cannot forget the very first point I say. <laughs> Whatever you want men to do to you, you do to them. And we give examples, and we conclude by saying, whatever the challenges may be, yours will be the kingdom of heaven. Makarios. You are blessed people, you understand? And you have been blessed that you can be a blessing to many people around you. Friends, this is the gold standard. The interesting fact about this gold standard was that it was abandoned in 1931. 
during the Great Depression, somehow they were not able to keep up this standard of gold. By the time it came to 1971, the US also abandoned it. And they joined a, what we call a floating exchange rate system. And that's what our international monetary system is based on today. So instead of gold, currencies today are pegged against one another. They are relative to one another. So one go up, one go down. One go up, one down. And you understand. You know? There's no longer a gold standard. Governments, you can print as much as you want or as little as you want. And I think that's contributing big time to the debt situation all over the place. And people are all wondering, when is that bubble going to burst? But here's the crazy thing. It also means that currencies are today not backed by gold. It's backed by nothing except the credibility of that nation and its government. Should there be a crash, our currencies are all worth nothing overnight. Do you know that in the society there's a parallel? There are no more absolutes. Everything is relative. It's a floating exchange rate system kind of thing, you know. And, and what I say, what you say, you know, today I'm right, tomorrow you're right, what I think, how you feel, you know, that's how the world is moving on today. Do you think we might be moving towards a moral crash of epic proportions? Where we then discover that what we have considered as important is actually worthless. Well, that all depends on the standard you're holding to, isn't it? Are you holding on to a gold standard? Or are you holding on to a floating standard? Has the church also abandoned this gold standard? Has the church also preferred to, to live with moral relativity and tolerance with the rest of the world, pegged to their values and culture and present-day narratives? This golden rule, or our gold standard of how we are to live as kingdom people, this is backed by the kingdom of God. Cannot fail one. You see, sometimes we think, oh, it's better to move with the world. Hello, they are backed by nothing other than the credibility of the, of the countries that you look at right now. Our gold standard is backed by the kingdom of God, who is run by the king of kings and the lord of lords. And when we say yes to Jesus, we, we say yes to the Christ. We said yes to the king. And we're not just kingdom people. We are also, the church is also called the bride of Christ, the bride of the Messiah, the bride of the king. We are betrothed to him. Now today, when we ask a man and a woman, will you have this person? Will you have? We answer, I will, right? In times past, I think we answered, they answered, I do, right? It's another alternative. And so when we said yes to Jesus, we said, I do to this king. And what did we say, I do to? We're saying, I do to, to live out that gold standard. That's what we promised him. We will love him and we will serve him. I hope that is true for all of you. I do. We are that bride of Christ. Will the church live the gold standard? If you watch on the screen, why is it I do? Because we said yes to, we will take the initiative. We will demonstrate the kingdom. We will make use of every opportunity. We will live as the king. We will bring him joy. But we need the power of his Holy Spirit. That's the gold standard. And our king has nothing but the best. We're going to pray after this. But before we do that, I just want to ask you to, we've got five weeks that we are not going to meet. Homework. I don't know, maybe the Holy Spirit has already dropped something in your heart, a person in your heart. What would be one thing, one person, one item, one situation that you can begin to live the gold standard? And if you say, I do to Jesus, would you obey Him in this one step? Homework. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank You for teaching us. Thank You for summarizing the entire law and prophets into one line. A big idea. And it's so simple that sometimes it's easy to ignore. It's so simple that we may find it not revelational enough. We like 
more complicated stuff. But the truth is, it's so simple that it's so tough to live it out. And Lord, we acknowledge that and we need your help. Lord, we know we don't live at this gold standard. If you left it to us, we will never meet that standard. But thank you for dying for us. Thank you for being that sacrifice for us that takes away all our sin. And as you do that, Lord, we know you also give us the Holy Spirit, the best gift ever, to enable us, to help us, to change us, that as we do our part, you will strengthen us, you will teach us, and you will lead us. And so I pray for myself and all who have listened in, help us, Lord, so that we can be kingdom people that make a good impact and influence to this world that is so dark. Enable us, Lord. And we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.